A church sanctuary is turned into a slaughterhouse by a lone gunman with a racist message. I've had to make statements like this too many times. Sad resignation from the president who had vowed before to keep guns from violent and disturbed people. I've decided I'm a candidate for president of the United States. Jeb Bush finally makes it official. He is running for president. What a surprise. And his campaign kickoff was kicking. Also, caliente. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today as we, as a country and as a community, deal with a devastating hate crime. The latest evidence is a disturbing web manifesto that was filled with racist rants, apparently posted by Dylan Roof. We were all stunned by the unprovoked murders of nine innocent worshipers at a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina on Wednesday night. People attending a Bible study class. It is the fourth time in recent years that one man with one or more guns has turned what people assumed were safe places, a shopping center, a movie theater, a school, a church, into a killing field. As for the crimes in Charleston this week, there is now little doubt the motivation was racist hate. Dylan Roof now faces nine murder charges at least and possibly the death penalty. And this morning, we want to talk about what happened in Charleston and its relevance to our community with our panel of guests. And what a panel it is. H.T. Smith is a well-known, widely respected attorney in Miami specializing in criminal defense. He started his legal career a few years ago as a public defender. Tiffany Lee is an attorney and a partner in the Miami office of Holland and Knight. She is a champion on diversity related issues within her firm and in the Florida Bar, graduate of the University of Miami Law School as well. Kevin Hill is a professor of political science at Florida International University and someone we in the news media turn to for insights at election time and other times like now. And good morning, everybody. Good Thank morning. So good much. morning. Great and happy day. Father's Day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let's begin. Uh, I want to ask each of you, but H.T., let me ask you to begin. Uh, is what happened in Charleston a anomaly? Is Dylan Roof an outlier, or is he a symptom of something deeper and more troubling, a wound, a racial wound that has never healed? Well, clearly it's a racial wound that never healed. Race is the fault line in our nation. In the past 50 years, we must admit we've made significant strides as a people but people are tired and we've got to understand that each generation has an obligation to as a relay race to keep this movement going forward until we totally eliminate racial superiority racial supremacy what we have a lot of people like the Dylan Roos of the world who are out there their rally cry is we're gonna take our country back from what they call the mud mm -hmm. people blacks Hispanics and Jews their battle flag the Confederate flag and so we must not only deal with the symbols of this race, uh, this hatred, but we also must deal with a lot of other things like guns and like reconciliation that needs to happen between average people who just don't want to get involved. This magical, memorable moment of America watching the victims, the families of the victims yeah. who had fresh wounds in their heart. It was extraordinary. Look at that, look at that man yeah. and say, we forgive you. Yeah. Just like the bombing in Birmingham, this has the possibility of being one of those moments that yeah. that jars America into action. Yeah. You, you know, it struck me, you bring up the bombing in Birmingham. I, we actually watched the movie Selma last night. And since 1963, laws have changed largely because of the efforts of civil rights fighters. But Tiffany, you and I talked about this once before. There is no institutional legal racism but boy there is another more um, under the radar racism that that I see as a white woman and I know that my colleagues and my friends deal with every day I think that's absolutely right I mean I view it as sort of a continuum um, you know what was before overt racism people were very comfortable um, acting out um, against people of color in this country now it's much more subtle that's not acceptable but that doesn't mean that bias doesn't ex still exist um, that doesn't mean that prejudices don't still exist that racism doesn't still exist um, and people find other ways to manifest that um, in the extreme you get a Dylan Roof and you get Charleston 
but on a daily basis, you have other, you know, smaller slights that people of color in America face. And Arthur Ashe said it best. He said, when, as he was dying from AIDS, he said, this is not the toughest battle I've ever fought. The toughest battle I've ever fought was waking up every day as a black man in America, dealing with the daily slights. Yeah. Cab won't stop. People uh, clutching their purse when I walk in the elevator. All kinds of little things like that. Yeah. Well, we heard uh, Michelle Obama a few months ago say she was in a store and was approached by somebody and asked to get something off a shelf for her as if she were a, a worker there. I mean, maybe it was an honest mistake, but uh, Kevin, let me ask you about uh, Dylan Roof. Do you think that he is an outlier or is he symptomatic of something more deep and dangerous in our society? Well, I guess he's an outlier in that people don't shoot up churches every single day of the week. And of course, you know, he's an outlier in that way because this is just such a horrific atrocity that he committed. But what I really worry about, uh, and I guess we'll see in the next few days as the investigation goes on, the investigations, I should say, go on, mm -hmm. is, is this thing, anything is sort of organized? Because there's a lot of people out there. I mean, you talk about the government, you talk about society, but there are specific groups of people out there. They're a little bit inchoate. They're not really, they might be internet groups or whatever. They might be, you know, uh, offshoots of what would have been a Klan or the white citizens councils 50 years ago but right. but but they they have a they have articulated ideologies well, you, they you, have you, belief systems right well you bring up an interesting point I mean we all know now we've all tried to learn what we can about Dylan Roof we know that he dropped out of school after mm -hmm. ninth grade uh, and yet he found out most of his information on the internet he said he went to Wikipedia to find about the uh, Emanuel AME Church uh, and and uh, he was angered by the uh, Trayvon Martin case. So he was concerned and he went to also websites apparently con connected to Rhodesia, mm -hmm. which is now Zimbabwe, and South Africa under apartheid. So he created this racist philosophy, it appears, on his own, not part of a larger group. Well, you know, I. I actually lived in Zimbabwe for three years, between 1989 and 1992, and when I saw that flag, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen that flag outside of a museum. And in the 20... photograph on, yeah. Yeah, his, on, his, on his jacket. The old right. Rhodesian flag. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't think much of it, and then, and then I, apparently this is, a, again, it's one of those symbols of this underground, or semi-underground, they're not really trying to hide anything, uh, underground sort of uh, this racist uh, old old-fashioned white supremacist movement and, yeah. it, and it's just an entire ecosystem of it out there and if it ever gets organized that scares me you know we have we have a couple of lawyers at their table today uh, I'm interested in hearing your take on South Carolina has no hate crime laws like Florida does per se um, and so now you hear the conversation and debate whether is this a hate crime might this be domestic terrorism charge under federal statutes or both, and what is the difference between hate and terror? How do you separate those two legally, Tiffany? Do you know? Well, I think that um, a hate crime is typically viewed as a crime motivated by some sort of prejudice, whether it be racial, um, sexual orientation, or something like that. My understanding of domestic terrorism, which is the other way that you might view this, and a lot of people are debating, should we view it that way now, um, is that it's more about an organized effort to impact or affect a particular group of people within you know, society. And isn't that what Dylan did? I think in this case, you can make an argument that it's both. And, well, and, and, and hasn't he told the investigators, I did it, and I did it for racial reasons. Right, to it's terrorize, what we believe. Yeah. To terrorize exactly. the community right. and to begin a race war. Kevin makes a very fine point, though, that we need to look at in Miami, and that is the organizational support for this ty type of ideology. We've got to do everything we can. This is homegrown terrorism. Mm -hmm. We've got to do everything we can to infiltrate and find out people who were involved in organizing, brainwashing young people like him to carry out, like Kevin said, we don't have this every day, but there are a lot of people that believe what he believes and we can have a situation where this begins to escalate. We need to nip it in the bud right now. Is there and a in difference Miami. here? Well, Miami, is, you know, this, and this is on the internet, it's everywhere, but Miami, we got a, a, another factor that we got to deal with and that's language. You know, we have, we'll, people say we're a diverse community. I don't agree with that. We can be a diverse community. We have a lot of different tribes who are bound together, don't get along, 
but are forced together as a result of geography and politics. Now, we've got, we're an immigrant nation. Hispanics have come to this nation, uh, come to this nation, come to our community, and really energized it in terms of economics and the great culture. But we've got to do something about situations where a black man walks in to try to get a job and they say, you cannot have the job because you speak Spanish. And that same job is given to someone who cannot speak English. That causes resentment, and those kinds of things do not help in terms of racial reconciliation. And so we have work to do right here in Miami. This can happen in Miami, too, yeah. and we need to do something about it, all of us. Well, that has been an ongoing source of irritation and friction between African Americans and the Hispanic community for a long time. Also, the complaint we have heard, Tiffany, that uh, uh, Hispanics don't want to hire us, they want to hire their own. But these are tribal allegiances. I mean, if we're going to move forward, we've got to address tribal allegiances mm -hmm. and try to get beyond them. And we're going to have to break some of it down. I mean, I would say that I think Miami is a diverse community, it's just not an inclusive community. Um, I remember coming here in 1994 from a small town in the Panhandle that used to be called the Redneck Riviera <laughs> and expecting <Still> <laughs> a lot, <laughs> expecting a lot from Miami from a standpoint of diversity and inclusion and being very disappointed. Um, you know, 20 plus years later, it's evolved a lot. There's a lot of progress, but we're not there. Well, I disagree only because I define diverse, diversity as being all of the major tribes feeling they're stakeholders in the community. That's my definition. Uh, just being here doesn't make it a diverse community if you're not stakeholders in sharing the power and in sharing the money. And understanding. And let's leave it here for just a couple of minutes and we will pick up where we left off when we come right back. Live in our studio this morning, our guest panelists, we are talking about what happened in Charleston, South Carolina on Wednesday night. And H.T. Smith, let me ask you, since you appear in court almost every day, uh, in Florida, uh, forgive me, I'm not the lawyer, you are, but in Florida, the family of victims of a crime may, after sentence has been, after somebody's been found guilty, and before sentencing, they may then, and only then, speak to the defendant directly. I mean, what was so extraordinary this week on Thursday was uh, uh, the judge, in this case, allowed five of the victim's families to speak directly to this man. Yeah, South Carolina may be the only state that has a law that allows victims to speak at bond hearings. We don't allow that. Then. This was wonderful for America to see. But look at the contrast. Inside, the family members are saying, you put a hole in our heart. You took away from us something that's priceless, but we forgive you. We pray for you. And the governor's outside saying, we're going to get the death penalty. Yeah. Come on. I mean, I, I think we need to move past killing, whether it's killing by individuals, by, whether it's killing by the government. And I think these families have really touched our hearts. Well, they touched the president's heart. He sent out a tweet that afternoon saying this shows the basic decency and goodness of the families of these victims and of America. But that's right. They, that's what it is. They were representative of most of Americans. Most Americans are good and decent people, but we got to understand that democracy is not a spectator sport. We can't just say, oh, we're so sorry. We've got to do something. Well, isn't that one of the hallmarks the... of hate is that the person who hates does not see people as human beings. I'm sorry, I interrupted no, you. No, I mean, I, I totally understand what the family did. I mean, it took a lot of courage. I don't know if I could have done that. You, know, you, know, you never know because you're not in that kind of situation. But, but the government, as the representative of society that we live in, for better or worse, does have a right and a responsibility to punish people. And even if you forgive people, they do need to be punished. And this was a crime not only against those poor people in that church and, and the entire African-American community of South Carolina and Charleston. It was a, that was, it was a crime against a, a decent way of life. And, 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 and I will, again, I, I said this before, but I'd be very interested to see how deep this goes with this, this uh, Dylan Roof's um, connection to mm -hmm. any, anybody well, else. Yeah. Well, Kevin and I will come back and we'll have a discussion about the death penalty. That's for another segment. day. I, I, yeah. That is for another day. <laughs> Tiffany, I, I, I want to <laughs> ask you, um, uh, I don't know if you are a church goer, but uh, you are, all right. I think that what was, I think, to all of us, certainly to me, so shocking about this was 
it's a Wednesday night Bible class, and there are nine African-American people in this church. They welcome this young white man in. They make him comfortable. They are so nice to him. He later tells the police, I almost didn't do this because they were so nice, but I had a mission. I mean, that's what really shocks us, isn't it? Yeah. Well, certainly, it's, I, mean, I mean, it's heartbreaking, um, you know, for not only for people of faith, but for people who understand that the faith, what the faith community represents um, in the black community and in, you know, the South. Um, but that's why he did it. You know, there was a shock value that he was looking for. He, mm -hmm. if, he, if he was going to incite people and get the reaction, it had to be dramatic. And that's why he did it, exactly how he did it. I do think it's amazing that in that one hour, and this shows you the power of faith and all that, you know, spirituality teaches us, that in that one hour, he had oh, doubt, right? Mm -hmm. He experienced enough, you know, one-on-one -on -one love, respect, um, sense of understanding that he was in doubt. Although, purportedly, he then, in a premeditated way, left somebody to survive to talk about what they had seen, which right. is chilling on its own. And the five-year-old girl yeah. who yes. laid on the floor and played dead. Mm. Yeah. Can you imagine the terror that she went through? And I'm just so happy that her life was spared. You know, um, Kevin, people might be able to tell from your accent that you are from South Carolina, and I think that you offer a very unique perspective this morning on the flag controversy. And boy, in the last 24 hours have I seen that debated mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. lot. It's blown up. But I think someone who is not from the rebel community might find it hard to understand how anyone can hang on to something that was a symbol really of rebellion and slavery and hate, and I look at it as no no less a comparison to the flag of the Third Reich and a swastika, which was a flag of a government, mm -hmm. yet also symbolizes something chilling to many people. Well, it's even worse than that. I mean, I, look, I grew up in South Carolina. My family's been there for hundreds of years. I don't understand why people still want to fly that flag. And there's a lot of people uh, around the country that don't either. And it's, it's, it's even worse than being a symbol of, say, the Confederacy, which was you know, obviously an act of treason against the United States. It's not just a symbol of uh, the, the armies of the Confederacy. That flag was put on that Capitol building in Columbia in 1962. It wasn't there before then. It was put there in 1962 as an act of defiance against, uh, you know, the Brown decision in 1954 and all of the civil rights legislation that was starting to come out then. And so, you know, you can't say it's just a symbol of, you know, my great 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 grandfather who, you know, who died at Chickamauga or something like that. It's it's a. Uh, it's, it's, it was there for a reason, and it right. took till 2000 to get that thing off the Capitol building. And it, but it's still flying nearby yeah, on yeah. its own flight staff, and it will not, apparently, the rules say it may not be lowered to half staff. Well, it's, it's, under, it's flying above the American flag right now. Yeah, and it's, it's under, the, under the laws of South Carolina, it's under the direct control of the legislature. Whereas the other flags, of course, are under control of the governor. So that opens up a whole other can of right. political worms that's kind of weird. Right. But political nationally now, now that the GOP primary mm -hmm. contenders are weighing in, I think Mitt Romney was the first that, that I saw to go public on Twitter right. about take down the flag. And, and now you see GOP contenders like Marco Rubio parsing their perspective. Well, I asked him, excuse line. me, I asked you were there Marco night. Rubio last night at a GOP fundraiser. Uh, in Miami, and I and other reporters said, what about the Confederate flag? Should it come down? And he was very circumspect. He said, well, that's really, basically, he said, that's up to the people of South Carolina, and I'll trust their judgment. Uh, on the other hand, H.T., I remember John McCain, when he lost the South Carolina primary, he said, uh, uh, four years ago, he, or eight years ago, he said, I lost, and I, I really betrayed my principles that flag, I should have said, it needs to come down. And that's one of the things that ordinary Americans can do, and that is speak out against that symbol of hate. And, and, I, and you know, it doesn't require money, it doesn't require marching, all it requires is speaking to the legislators that represent you, either on the state or national level, take down that flag, that symbol of hate. That and I'm more interested in not just what they say about the symbol, but are they willing to take on all that the symbol represents? Mm -hmm. The institutional racism, all of the disparities that they have direct impact and control over. Saying take down the flag is easy. A beautiful message to end this discussion on. Appreciate that. We are out of time. 
you'll be back. <laughs> Thanks so much Thank you. again for joining us today. From our discussion here. We must choose to either cling to a past that will never come back or embrace a future that we cannot avoid. By the way, just, just so that our friends know, the next President of the United States will pass meaningful immigration reform so that that will be solved, not by executive order. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And where do we even begin? <laughs> well, I don't know. A lot of xenophobia and some also some intelligence there from three of the, what, 16 announced presidential candidates. Well, we are going to get to that in just a minute. It is time for a more critical, analytical look at the top stories in the news in the week this hour uh, with the Powerhouse Roundtable. And we have some serious brain power here today. Ed Puzzoli is an attorney and president of the Trip Scott firm in Fort Lauderdale. He's also a Republican Party activist, attended, in fact, this week's Jeb Bush campaign kickoff you just saw. Marlon Hill is a lawyer as well, a partner at Hamilton Miller & Berthesel in Miami. He was there this week when Haitian Americans and Dominicans spoke out against the deportations underway right now in the Dominican Republic. Katie Fang is a former prosecutor who now practices with the Berger Singerman firm in Miami. All veterans of the roundtable, welcome right. back. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Oh. Katie Fang, let, uh, let me begin with you. Sure. What, what, does, what do you think this awful, tragic incident uh, in Charleston tells us about the state of race relations in mm -hmm. the country and race relations in our community. Well, I took the time to read the manifesto that he allegedly wrote on his website. I don't know. I take very small comfort that he apparently liked Asian people, so putting that <laughs> aside, because he said that. Um, you know, I think that you, you empower racist rhetoric when you repeat what was the purpose behind this. If this was a hate crime, that's what it is. But I think that the more that the media ends up talking about it, I think it ends up spreading a negative message into um, the, the, the world at large. Well, and that's so, always the dilemma of media is that on one hand, you've got to report what the facts are, get it out there, let people see what's going on. On the other hand, every time you say his name, you are making him perhaps a bit bigger. And isn't that what he yes. wanted to do? He wanted somebody to survive to talk about it. So then Obama says this is a about gun control. I'm not sure if it's about gun control. I think it's deeper than that. And I think that in order to stop a racist rhetoric, I don't think the gun control issue is what should be focused upon by Obama. He was actually pending a felony charge. And in South Carolina, you cannot get a gun if you have a pending felony charge, but he got it from his dad. And there are no gun laws in South Carolina that deal with private exchanges of guns. And that's kind of important for people to understand. It was not just you know him walking into, store, into a store and buying the gun. And and so I think that, again, if you want to empower him and his racist message, then to talk about it more and more, I think it's important for people to understand what happened, but I think it needs to be a little bit more, you know, encapsulated into a direct, in direct issue. You know, Ed, it, it, it may not be about guns in this particular instance, but I think Katie raises a good point. Uh, in Florida, although if any citizen wanted to walk into a gun shop and fill out the form, and, and go through the waiting period. You can get a handgun or a rifle, uh, but if you go to a gun show, uh, if you just go to your neighbor's house, nobody checks to see whether you have a, a history of mental illness or a criminal record. I mean, it's really not hard to get a gun. Well, you hit on something really interesting, Michael. It is a mental health issue in this narrow instance, right? It, beyond the tragedy that it was for the victims in the church and that community, that was an offense to us all. I mean, I, I heard Kevin Hill say that, and I totally agree with it in the previous segment, that it was an offense to us all. But when it comes right down to it, this is about a mental health issue for that one individual. Let's not make it bigger or broader than it is. I think that we've got to be careful about the way we deal with this, both from a, a racial sensitivity standpoint, because there's a lot of healing still left to be done, yeah. but it impacted but us all. He wanted, but, but Ed, uh, I, I, I see your point, and I, I know you're arguing as a good lawyer would, but he wanted to make it big. He wanted to make, I mean, Marlon, this is a guy who said, told one of the victims, Sylvia Johnson, let her live. He said, I have to do this 
you rape our women and you're taking over our country and you have to go. I know, mean, you know, Michael, um, Ed, I really have to take issue that this is a the mental, mental health issue only having to do with one person. If that's the case, then we have to really look at the mental health of our country, right? Because culture and where mental mm -hmm. health comes from and what people believe and their behaviors translate into actions. So we really then have a serious problem of mental health in America, if that's the case. Can I just raise, why are we talking about him as if he is mentally ill? And he may be or he may be not, but we don't know that yet. But this is, I guess, a, a form of derangement. Anyone who kills someone with a gun may yeah. have mental issues. But this, you know, we look at someone who has done something evil and horrible, he may not be mentally ill. And the, the question becomes, you know, gun control has become such a, uh, a fiery word. It, it's about. It's not about taking guns away. It's not. It's about making people safe and preserving personal freedoms. And so, mental illness is one thing. Is that the Dylan Roof story, though, or is it just racial hate? And and how do you keep guns away from people who will do wrong? And that's the question. It, 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 the question is, how do you get in someone's mind? So, if you just posted the manifesto, as abhorrent as it is to anybody sitting at this he's table. He's allowed to do he's it. He's allowed to do it. Under the First Amendment, Under the he's First allowed Amendment. to post it. Where, yeah. he, where someone like that crosses the line is, in, is where I think the craziness comes, whether legally or not, is where he takes action upon it. And that's where the, that's the, that's honest, right. and that's the honest conversation that we're miss, right. missing in America, right? Right. We're trying to run away from our racial history that has given fodder for all the actions over the years and have, have also turned into murder. But, he picked, mass murder. but he picked the state to do it, and South Carolina has the death penalty, and there's a punitive aspect to what you do, and maybe that's the message that gets sent. You go out, you commit a race-based crime, you will be looking at the death penalty for what you've done to innocent victims, and maybe that's a part of the dialogue, too, outside of just the gun control issue. Would it, would it have been any less crazy if he walked into a white church? I don't think so. Certainly and, not. And so, and so, so, the, so the attack is really an offense to us all, not just one race or the other. And so let's not make that divide. That's where I think the problem is. This is an issue for us all to deal with. Well, the, look at Aurora, Colorado. A white person walked into a movie, movie theater, theater filled with right. whoever. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but Dylan Roof made this a racial crime. Yeah, he did. And as we speak, there are churches and pews where America is highly segregated, right? And this is a moment we're reading from the same hymn book, singing from the same hymn book, and reading from the same Bible. So we really need to have an honest conversation, um, That's fair. Ed and others, um, about exactly where we are in America, because this is a serious culture issue for us. Well, if I can, let's talk about America's fetish with guns. I mean, we have got it in the Second Amendment, of course, a well-regulated militia. I don't know the way I read it doesn't seem to have much to do with an AK-47. But, you know, here we have in recent years, Gabby Giffords, uh, Congresswoman Arizona, is in a shopping center. A lunatic comes, shoots her, tries to kill her. Thank God he failed. He did kill somebody else. We have uh, the mass shooting in Aurora, Col Colorado, that uh, Glenna mentioned. We have Newton, Connecticut, where a deranged young man goes into a school, you know, shoots and kills 20 people, kids. And now we've got this instance in Charleston where this guy's got this 45 caliber Glock and he reloads five times. Uh, uh, Marlon, at some point you have to say to yourself, when is Congress going to say we're stronger than the NRA and we are going to make it harder for people uh, to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them? when Congress begins to listen to the people of America. America has to step up as to recognizing that we have this problem, right? The Second Amendment, Michael, is not gonna go anywhere, right? As Americans, looking each other in the eye, at church, outside of church, wherever we are, we have to have a serious conversation as to have responsible ownership of guns. How can we manage that? in a manner that people, legal, law-abiding people can um, But there was no nothing about amendment. him that I think would have highlighted that there was going to be a problem. I mean, albeit the manifesto being on the internet, again, the First Amendment allows you to put that type of dreck on the internet, right? right. So what would there have been about him that gun control could have stopped? There is this <laughs> private sale loophole that exists in South Carolina and 40 yeah, other his states. Arrest record, actually. His what, arrest he, he had what, never what been arrested. It was him, the first Katie? time he had been arrested was this yeah. year, yeah, actually. What, what could have stopped him? conceivably is his father or a family member who would have said son you know I know you want a gun but I think you have 
some emotional problems. Well, that's personal accountability. That's personal responsibility. And in fact, the dad's looking at up to 10 years in prison in yeah. South Carolina because of what happened. And so he should be. He's got liability too and culpability. So yeah. it's a personal accountability. It, it starts with mm -hmm. the community conversation. Who am I vis a vis other people with race and culture? And then it starts with personal responsibility. Should the father have given the gun to well, the son? Well, it goes back to the Second Amendment. And, and I, Michael, with all due respect, I think the Second Amendment does provide for ownership of, of guns sure to does. private individuals. Yeah. The question is, like every right that the Constitution lays out, there's a, a corresponding responsibility that goes with it. And so that's what we're really now talking about with the father. Okay, yeah. quick break. We will be right back. We are rocking and rolling with our powerhouse <laughs> roundtable this morning. And let's move on now to, if we can, to some presidential politics. Ed Pozzoli saw you and your beautiful daughter, who is here with you in the studio this morning, uh, at the kickoff of uh, Jeb Bush's formal announcement of his campaign. Yep. Uh, I say in an unbiased way, I thought it was a very well done event. I thought Jeb delivered a very powerful uh, speech. But more importantly, he was genuine. He was Jeb, the Jeb that we know, uh, and that Floridians have come to know. He stands for what he stands. He's a principled person. You talked about before the, the, the Confederate flag, you know, under Jeb Bush, that flag came down in Florida very quietly, without fanfare, and it just came down and it was shipped to a museum where it belongs. And so, under Jeb, a lot of those things, principled leadership, you saw some of that. I think the crowd was energized, both, both by what he said and the energy that he brought. Uh, that was the real key there. You know what, something that he said, he, he made promises Monday. He, he, he laid did. out a little bit of a platform. He, and he mentioned he was going to grow the economy by 4% in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So I went back to look, just kind of peripherally. No president has done that in mm, my lifetime. How is that possible? How will that be possible with the economy we have now? We well, you know Jeb um, is, is always um, being a, a bold thinker, a bold ideas, even if you disagree with him, right? Um, but certainly he has to make a stand and set yeah. big goals. Yeah, well, he even has a term for it. He calls them BHAGs, <laughs> big, audacious, hairy, uh, audacious goals. Tony BHAG. Jennings on Monday and, at the podium, a former yeah. lieutenant governor, brought yeah. up the BHAGs. Yeah, the well, BHAGs something else about this event that I found also very interesting, Glenna and I, were there when uh, uh, Marco Rubio announced his candidacy. And in some ways, Glenna, I found this, uh, it wasn't a predominantly may, maybe Hispanic crowd, but in some ways, this was more a Hispanic mm -hmm focused event than Marco's was. Well, I think Marco's event, if I, if I remember correctly, at Freedom Tower, it was very Cuban exile centric. That is his background, that is his passion. And although he says, you know, I am the man for the new generation, his kickoff was actually sort of yeah. looking back. I think Jeb Bush's crowd was very mixed, very young. It was at Miami-Dade College, so you had that there. But he lives an immigrant. He's not an immigrant, but he lives an immigrant culture life. His children are bicultural. His wife is Mexican. So it was a very interesting contrast to see and hear the two Florida candidates who are actually very different He's, in those ways. And Jeb spoke Spanish beautifully at that event. I mean, really beautiful, flawless Spanish. And his ads have been out in his Spanish. His ads have been out in Spanish. Yeah. And look, Florida, here's a comment on that. Florida really should be proud, to, to be blunt. We have Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio vying for the presidency of the United States, among a bunch of others. So you don't count Mike Huckabee, who lives in the panhandle? Uh, you know, like, let's Aww. just deal with the two, the two Rubio and, and Bush. Florida is coming Transplant. of age. Florida yeah. is coming of age. We used to be in New York with the Roosevelts and some others, but now it's Florida. And but, I think that's uh, we're taking our rightful place. But are they diluting each other because they're both coming out of Florida? Certainly. Are they certainly. hurting each they? other? Not with the winner-take-all primary, though. Well, true. But, but did they, should they have coordinated? I don't know. No. You know, somebody has suggested that Marco Rubio is an upstart. That's a word I've heard. Marco Rubio is a young upstart. He should have had more deference to somebody that kind of paved the way for him. I don't so know any said, young upstart who would ever do that. Katie, <laughs> Katie, exactly in his, right. in young his, upstart, what? By definition. You know, in his speech last night, in fact, uh, uh, Senator Rubio said, when I ran to be the House Speaker, they told me it wasn't my time. When I ran for the U.S. Senate, I was told it wasn't my time. When I wanted to run for president, 
they told me, no, you've got to wait and, and get in line behind people. And he that's said, different. that's not how it works. And I think that's a good point that he made because, you know, Jeb Bush also said at his speech that it's not anyone's time. And yeah. I think that's a good way right. for us to put there, it. That there is no divine debate. right of kings either. I, I mean, no oh, dynasty. Anymore, yeah. Let's, no, well, uh, the Bush well look, dynasty, look, maybe. look, look, now, wait a second. Now, Jeb Bush said he's going to go campaign and not, and not be entitled to anything. He's going to campaign for every vote in Florida and everything. In fact, he was complimentary of, of Marco Rubio during that, during that segment yeah. of the speech. It's different than what you see on the other side of the aisle. Essentially, you see an anointment of Hillary, and where, where's the competition to challenge, to challenge the debate, to challenge, to hone our message, to really focus in on the, what the Democrats truly want in a candidate? They don't have many choices. We might have too many on the Republican oh. side, but the Democrats don't have too many choices. Why, that's an, well, that's an anointment. You, but why do you have to make excuses, Ed, if you have a strong candidate that stands, you know, stands for what she stands for? And you mean everybody's waiting their turn on the Democratic side? You don't have anybody else who wants to be president. If she stumbles, Ed, we all know if she stumbles, the vacuum uh, will be filled. Uh, before we though, run Michael. out of time, I want to bring up a, a subject that is dear to the heart, particularly uh, of you, Marlon Hill, and that is what is going on in the Dominican Republic, where a couple of hundred thousand Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent are possibly going to be deported because of a whole series of actions. Where, do this, where does that stand? Well, you know, the, the government of the Repu Dominican Republic um, has a sovereign right to p um, protect its borders. Um, where have we heard that issue before? Um, um, but certainly, um, ha Dominicans of Haitian descent, that's really the issue in terms of the court case that was stripped um, those persons of their citizenship. Yeah, back to 1929. And could create you know, several humanitarian problems um, for that country. Um, and it's very important for us. We have strong economic ties to the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And, and, and something family worth, ties. Worth us and family ties. Right. And a lot of the people who are stand to be deported uh, do not speak Creole. They don't really know Haiti. Uh, they would be going back to a country that is foreign. To and them. a country that may not necessarily be prepared to accept them as well. Because it's a lot of them. And, There's you know, a lot of them. They have a grace period of 45 000. days if they have, quote, registered. But Michael's right. It's 288-something thousand registrants so far. And the phrase ethnic cleansing has actually been used to describe mm -hmm. what's going on. And I it really just is. Say that. I mean, you're targeting a particular group of people. You're making them register. You're I mean, making them register. It's of before. It's very disturbing that that's happening. And their history is a little bit. Registering a There is a little bit of a rivalry between... Dominican and, and Haiti, so there's a little bit of that because you see in some of the politics involved, but but you know there's got to be a solution to those to those folks that you've identified as as children of illegal immigrants who are born in, in the DR, who live there, who grew up with the culture, who very heritage. good point, Ed. I mean, really, their own dreamers. Very good, good point, Ed. Their dreamers. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we are going to have to hold it there. You all are a rock and round table. <laughs> so appreciate you coming in on Father's Day. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. And when we come back, two South Florida cities draw a line in the sand between a big important annual event and a community's quality of life. Stay tuned. The heated debate over moving the Miami International Boat Show to a renovated Miami Marine Stadium took center stage this week. Miami City leaders are for that move. Those in Key Biscayne have filed a lawsuit to block it. And that lawsuit triggered a mediation session this week, but neither side was willing to budge. On one side, Miami. Let's see if this works once. Key Biscayne on the other. One road in, there's one road out, and there's no parking. And at issue, one of the oldest and most financially important annual events in South Florida, the International Boat Show. Miami is paving the way to move it to Virginia Keys Miami Marine Stadium site on the Rickenbacker Causeway waterfront. We are willing to commit to Key Biscayne that we would not have more than one event of this magnitude. Uh, if we want to do it there, who's going to tell you not to do it? The city's face-to-face -face meeting Tuesday was part of mediation required in Key Biscayne's lawsuit, alleging Miami's plan violates the master plan for this public parcel. The city is investing $16 million to create a park and a site for events. Special events and convention venue that houses 30 to 40,000 people. That would not, that is not uh, public use and it's not park use and that is what we object to. The meeting was packed with t-shirted people who benefit from the business the boat show brings and environmentalists arguing to protect the fragile shoreline and sea life and Key Biscayne residents concerned for their community. If you want to say, tell the city of Miami what to do on our property, then come in there and help improve our property and be a part of the process.
That was actually very interesting at the meeting because what sounded like a challenge did draw some interest. Seemed to, but there is no meeting that is set for the future and the boat show, yes, it's scheduled to go on in February. Hmm. Coming up, Florida's 11th hour state budget heads to the governor. You will see lawmakers purposely left out some of the funding voters told them to spend. That is next. Let's go now to a live look from our Fort Lauderdale camera, and it looks hot and sunny out there. Wow, what a surprise. <laughs> Here's Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa with the Sunday forecast. Go, Jayco. Hey, good morning, Glenna, and happy Father's Day, Michael. Happy Father's Day to all. Yes, it is sunny, it is hot, and it is the first day of summer, and we're feeling it already. It is 90, or rather 89 degrees, but it feels like 97 in Fort Lauderdale. So it is humid out there with an east southeast wind at 13 miles per hour. Right now, temperatures are hitting those upper 80s, except Pembroke Pines hitting 92. And it will get hotter than this uh, as we head into the middle of the afternoon. It feels like 101 in Marathon, 96 for Miami, 97, as I mentioned, in Fort Lauderdale. It feels like 99 in Pembroke Pines. So definitely feels like are hitting those triple digits. Drink plenty of water if you're doing anything outdoors. We do have one shower to talk about uh, trailing over saddle bunch keys and eventually impacting key west it will move out of here really fast uh, we could see a couple of thunderstorms later in the afternoon impacting central and western portions of florida but it's relatively dry out there also the longest day of the year summer solstice is is with us today 13 hours and 46 minutes of daylight enough time to head out to the beach use that sunscreen drink plenty of water really nice out there at the keys uh it's a moderate chop for the base. The seas between two to three feet. Highs today, 92 degrees, and we're sticking to the 90s for the start of the new week. Glenna? Jennifer, thank you. With the focus on the down to the wire fight over health care and Medicaid money, Florida lawmakers made some decisions in the $78 billion budget passed Friday that just don't hold water. Literally. Remember Amendment 1? Last fall, three out of every four voters, more than four million people, voted to dedicate a portion of real estate tax to buy and conserve land with an eye toward protecting long term our water supply. In this first budget since, lawmakers took the money and spent most of it in other projects they deemed water connected, like replacing funding from some existing departments and expenses. Land acquisition to protect against overdevelopment, well, that got a fraction of what voters mandated and even less than was allocated before the amendment passed. So this may be a good time to show you this map. This is a 10-year NASA study. It was released last week, and it shows where groundwater aquifers are depleted. Look up there in the left-hand corner. There's Florida in orange, shades away from drought-ridden California. Voters handed lawmakers a significant pot of money with instructions in the state constitution that they did not follow. So does that mean that they acted unconstitutionally? Well, that will be for the courts to decide if and when someone decides to file a challenge. But clearly, lawmakers acted as if they either didn't hear voters or don't care what they said. So what do you think about all that? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. And email, Twitter, uh, Facebook, any of those addresses are where you can find us. And we like hearing from you. And don't forget, stay informed, get involved. And happy Father's Day to you. Thank happy you. Happy Father's Day, Daddy Dearest. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Have a great Sunday.